Um, yes. Um, is the uh, consultant clinical neurophysiologist attached to quite a lot of hospitals. Um, Candy, Kurunagala, Amradapura, Badulla, Ampar. So I think he's covering uh, more than half of the country. So um, I, I think he's getting referrals ranging from Warkapal to Jaffna. So, <laughs> so definitely he's covering more than half of the country. So we have only four clinical neurophysiologists for the whole of Sri Lanka, out of uh, whom two are in Colombo, one in Gaul, and he's the other one. So um, Dr. Dharma Kirti has graduated with honors from University of Peradeniyam, trained under Dr. Sudat Gunasekara, who, was the, who is the first clinical neurophysiologist in Sri Lanka. And he had his overseas training at the prestigious National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery, which is supposed to be the, the hospital or the birthplace of neurology, um, which is the Queen Square Hospital in London, under Professor Martin Kolsenberg, um, who is the head of department there, who is an authority on neurology. So uh, I was told that only two people have had the opportunity to undergo training at this prestigious hospital, which is just like the Maudsley Hospital for Psychiatry. In 1978, Dr. J.B. Kiris had undergone training there. And in 2004, 14, sorry, Dr. Dharma had gone there for his training. He has all, uh, also had training at the Mayo Clinic, in um, Arizona and Minnesota in the USA. And uh, Dr. Dharma Kirti has introduced intraoperative neuro monitoring, which was initiated for the first time in Sri Lanka in the hospital of Kurunayagam. Um, and he has also introduced video telemetry to Anuradhapura Hospital. And his uh, main interests are electromyography, epilepsy, epilepsy surgery, pain management and so on. So um, uh, it was quite difficult. I must uh, admit that uh, <laughs> it was quite difficult to get hold of Dr. Dharma <laughs> for this presentation. I have been trying this for a long time to have, uh, have a training, uh, physical training or in-person training at Candy Hospital for our trainees. Um, uh, but then I thought uh, that uh, rather than having a few trainees in Candy and Peradeniya, that it's better for us to have him to talk to us on uh, ABC of EEG or introduction to EEG for the whole audience, where we can have all the trainees as well as uh, practicing psychiatrists, because I think it's a very important topic for us, because we have to deal with EEG on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, at least to have a brief idea. I know that uh, we will not be able to go into the extent of uh, looking at an EEG and diagnosing, but at least to say whether this is normal or abnormal. Uh, and um, that uh, at least a brief uh, idea of uh, introduction or with an introduction of EEG, I think this uh, presentation will be quite beneficial in our clinical practice for all of us. Thank you very much, Dr. Dharma Kirti, for accepting my invitation and agree to do this presentation. I know that you are a very busy person and you have to go to Badulla or Ampara today, I think. And um, um, thank you again. Thank you so much, Mr. President. All that work. Thank you very much for agreeing for this. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, let me share my slides. Hope you can see my presentation slides. Can yes, you we hear can everybody? See. Yeah, yeah. We can yeah. Uh, see and hear you well. Okay. Uh, I feel a bit euphoric after that uh, brilliant introduction. Thank you, sir, for that. And uh, what you see here is um, actually a tracing of ECG, electrocardiogram. And uh, this uh, lecture is meant to uh, mainly for postgraduates and um, uh, I beg your pardon. I know there are very well experienced uh, uh, psychiatrists who may be listening to these uh, professors and my teachers. Um, so this is a very basic study, especially meant to be uh, for postgraduate students. So going back to medical student uh, time, what we see is the ECG tracing. I mean, it was PQRS uh, complexes and which was a bit easy to 
learn during our you know medical student period um, and uh, the actually uh, to start with the the normal pattern of ecg electrocardiogram was very easy to learn and what was difficult for us to learn was um, the abnormal patterns of electrocardiogram uh, such as let's say ischemic changes or uh, more difficult ones for me was uh, like arrhythmias and you know conduction blocks and all uh, hi Prasita. can see you <laughs> nice to see you up long time and uh, so um uh, but when uh, we start seeing these traces you know the eeg electroencephalograms compared to electrocardiograms it was a horrible you know during medical certain time, uh, I didn't even want to look at these papers. Uh, and uh, once I became a medical registrar, uh, uh, still, you know, all, all the time, you know, these uh, big books, uh, pages and pages of EEG tracings were uh, aligned peacefully by the side of the bed head ticket. And uh, I didn't want to, uh, you know, even look at them. Because so so chaotic uh, the wave patterns, the brain waves compared to you know electrocardiograms that we were familiar to, and uh, uh, something like if I see this slide, uh, you know in the EEG, I don't know where to start it. So that was the the first uh, you know feeling uh, when we to, uh, you know. The word comes to electroencephalography, but uh, you believe me, diagnosing EEG electroencephalography abnormalities are extremely easier than uh, electrocardiogram uh, ECG abnormalities. But mm -hmm. um, uh, identifying a normal uh, electroencephalography EEG. Uh, patterns are the more difficult to learn. This is the trickiest thing. Now, e ECG, it's easy to uh, identify normal patterns, but in EEG, the most difficult one is to identify normal pattern. That is because there are uh, quite abnormal looking patterns, but which are normal. So, uh, it's extremely important to identify a normal uh, uh, EEGs first before we are trying to identify uh, abnormal uh, EEGs. So I started the story. Uh, I met a 72 years old father of three um, about uh, this is in 2014, couple of weeks before I leave to foreign training. Presented with intermittent chest pain, and you might wonder why this uh, patient with chest pain came to me. Well, um, uh, he's from my village area, and uh, you know, uh, once some patients get used to you, uh, you might have experience even they come for you and for anti worm treatment for you. So, like that, this guy came for to get some opinion from me regarding his chest pain. And he's a diabetic uh, with a mild renal impairment and hyperlipidemia. Well, he was uh, extensively investigated for ischemic cardiac uh, diseases, which came uh, normal. And there were no abnormalities that they couldn't find. And uh, they did XI CCGs, uh, but they didn't do any stress ECG because uh, of the renal impairment. Uh, then uh, they consulted. Uh, you know, gastroenterologist and uh, um, possibility of reflux uh, is about GL disease was excluded. And um, uh, there were no sort of chest abnormalities. By the way, the only thing that I had to do was EEG. So I did the EEG and uh, to see there were some abnormal, uh, uh, you know, fees of discharges, the epileptic form discharges seen in the mid uh, temporal region on the left side. And HB in 72, quite a high chance to find a structural lesion. And we did uh, MRI scan 
and found to have a temporal lobe lesion, um, uh, low grade uh, meningioma, you know, the slow growing tumor. And it was resected um, and patient got symptom free uh, before I leave to UK. So we'll go to the topic proper, the introduction to EG. I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, is it weird, you know, Zoom meeting the, uh, without seeing the audience? Uh, uh, again, I beg your pardon if I, uh, you know, uh, get you at, you know, if I can't get your attention to me. Uh, anyway, uh, let me ask another question from you. Uh, who was the first to discover basic EEG pattern in humans? You have the chance to answer. And let me see. Tusita is here, my friend. Uh, so, anyone is having any idea of Gyan or Tusita and uh, who discovered the basic EEG? So, so, I give a multiple choice. Uh, you know, answer, you know, I make it a multiple choice question. So is it a neurophysiologist or a neurologist or a psychiatrist? And uh, is it um, an electrician? So uh, the answer would be, uh, let me tell you, it was a psychiatrist who uh, first discovered, uh, you know, EEG uh, wave patterns in humans. So uh, it was uh, Hans Berger, a German psychiatrist, uh, later pioneered in uh, uh, electroencephalography and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, scientific researchers uh, with regard to uh, human behavior and brain function. Okay, so Hans Berger, uh, so I'm privileged to deliver this lecture to psychiatrists uh, who, you know, found the EEG patterns. Uh, uh, Sumudu, can I, can I get your help? I can't see my video uh, hello yeah um, what can I, uh, because i can't see myself so uh, in this uh, screen is that that you ah, can't okay. see your screen? okay yeah yeah now i can now i can yeah okay right. fine thanks and so hansberger first discovered this alpha wave pattern which is the basic rhythm uh, uh, in our brain waves, and um, uh, he also described the, the variability of uh, the appearance and disappearance of uh, alpha wave pattern uh, in EEGs. This picture shows um, how we record the EEG um, because uh, maybe most of you, although you are capable of reading EEGs. Uh, especially process might not have seen. So uh, you insert, uh, you know, you uh, attach certain wires according to a certain pattern uh, and uh, EEG being recorded. Uh, and there are certain, uh, you know, um, uh, in induction procedures during the EEG. This can be uh, done in a seated position or a supine position on the bed. Then in Sri Lanka, we used to do it on the bed. Uh, they kind of a custom. So uh, there are certain modalities of uh, EEG. Routine EEG is, uh, you, these are the most frequent ones, uh, about 90% of the EEGs we do are routine EEGs. So the usual time period is about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and uh, we do you know, hundreds of EEGs per week, uh, in Candy Hospital. And uh, there are certain other, you know, these are all same kind of uh, the, the procedure we do, but certain conditions like sleep deprived DEG. Uh, in sleep deprived DEG, one thing I wanted to, uh, you know, remind clinicians is that how do you advise for a patient to come for a sleep deprived DEG? Because when I report, sometimes uh, if the report is normal, I would 
that uh, suggests sleep deprived ej then you have to advise the patient the way to advise is um, uh, you ask the patient simply just have maximum of 4 hours of sleep before uh, come to the test that uh, either patient can go to the bed around 12 in the midnight and get up at uh, let's say 4 o'clock or uh, whatever the way the maximum time period uh, that can be allowed to patient is 4 hours prolong the eg monitoring like uh, intensive care units and video telemetry we'll talk about them later uh, you know uh, this practice intensive care Uh, EEG monitoring is quite uh, common in Western countries, uh, UK, but because of uh, lack of facilities and especially the manpower, we don't do uh, like uh, 24 hours, seven days, and three to four months of continuous monitoring EEGs in Sri Lanka. But uh, in hospitals in like UK, they do. Uh, months and months of continuous eeg monitoring and uh, we were supposed to sort of go through those 24 hours the eeg is those during our training um video telemetry is something uh, that uh, we do uh, it's not a very complicated thing again just uh, you record the eeg for about 7 days uh, uh, while uh, you know simultaneous uh, video monitoring Uh, and in telemetry what we do is uh, especially to when the the patient is in diagnostic dilemma or else if you want to particularly uh, localize the focus uh, that uh, if you are planning for a epilepsy surgery uh, so what we do is during telemetry we slowly tail off uh, the medications over 1 to 3 days and uh, while we are monitoring uh, eeg uh, and uh, we we are trying to make a fit or a seizure by the patient and then it's easy to uh, localize the the focus of uh, electrical activity well ambulatory eeg is just like ambulatory electrocardiogram are very beneficial especially uh, if the patient is having uh, fits in certain conditions because uh, you know so there are patients coming uh, with pseudo fits and some of them have uh, fits during uh, let's say eating like in eating epilepsy and to make the the problem worse and some people get this eating epilepsy only in one particular meal let's say at the breakfast or uh, the dinner or something like that so in which case ambulatory eeg so you set all the wires to the head and there's a small uh, gadget uh, recording device which you can uh, put in your wallet and you know you can walk around do day to day activities as uh, usual uh and uh, but in sri lanka we don't do ambulatory eeg medicine because you know we can't sort of trust our people and they might vanish with the gadget so it is very expensive uh, which could uh, be about 80 million so sorry 8 million and uh, so we don't do ambulatory eegs in sri lanka uh, and uh, electrocorticography is a recording of uh, brain waves uh, exactly on the uh, on the brain tissue itself rather than recording through the scalp um so electrocorticography we do uh, during uh, surgeries and sometimes to uh, diagnose also uh, we do very very rarely where you record uh, directly over the pyrometer or you can insert needles into the let's say the sort of uh, uh, hidden areas like mesial temporal uh, areas or uh, deep seated structures uh, uh sometimes close to thalamus or these circuits and uh, that is electrocorticography uh, there is another modality of eeg called magnetoencephalography which is a uh, usually uh, i mean which is a very uh, rare to find this uh, specific thing it's it gives kind of a 3d uh, mapping for the focus of the electrical activity and a 
it is very easy to uh, find the deep seated uh, electrical focus so that uh, you can uh, help the neurosurgeons to get the focus out very easily. But uh, this facility, even in England, only two places it's available in only two places. One is Queen Square, one in some in Walton Center. So your potential studies. There are another modalities of your potential studies, but uh, this is something not uh, quite related to epilepsy, but other brain disorders like demyelination, multiple sclerosis. Uh, in that spectrum of diseases, we do your potentials. So, okay. Uh, so before we see brain waves, especially for postgraduate, I want to uh, show this uh, uh, the the way of uh, arraying uh, electrodes on our scalp. Um, just to keep in mind the anything that. I mean, it's related to EEGs that are attached to your scalp on your right side of the head are depicted with uh, even numbers like four, eight, and all. Uh, and the leads that are attached on your left side of the brain or the scalp are, are depicted with uh, odd numbers. And also, uh, electrodes are named. So that it represents the cortical uh, area which is underlying the lead. <clears throat> so usually the frequently uh, used electrodes are like FP, that is uh, anterior frontal brain region. That is, uh, we call it FP, means frontopolar electrodes. And F is for frontal and C for central, that the, you know, central, that the, the uh, the top of your the, the scalp. And T for temporal, P for parietal, cortical regions, and O for occipital. So again, even numbers on the right side, odd numbers on the left side. And uh, we have this system of uh, measuring the scalp when we attach uh, electrodes. We call it 10 to 20 system. That is, uh, we measure our scalp from nation, the, you know, the deep at your, the, the upper uh, edge of the nose to the ionian where you can feel uh, the, you know, the hump at the occipital bone. Or we measure this distance and out of the distance, 10, 20 percent like that, we uh, place the leads. Or we call it 10, 20 system, the universal system that currently we use uh, usually for recording EEGs. And this system is also called Queen's Sky system. Again, uh, this slide shows uh, odd numbers, debit left, uh, even numbers uh, shows right side leads. Good. So there are many ways of recording EEG, just, just to tell you. Uh, out of two uh, uh, commonly used uh, recording uh, uh, modes are bipolar recording. Uh, and referential recording. So in bipolar recording, just to uh, explain you, what you see here is, uh, actually this is a picture of uh, Gihan Masbinovin, the nature man. Uh, what you see here is, uh, you know, five peaks of uh, Knuckles mountain range. So bipolar is recording like, you know, you uh, compare the electrical activity of this peak to that peak. So it's kind of a relative, uh, relative uh, voltage difference you measure. And uh, then what happens is it's not the exact uh, magnitude of the electrical uh, the, the discharge you get, but it's a relative magnitude of the electrical discharge uh, which is represented. But this is quite good. And I prefer this because we compare uh, relative uh, voltage, I mean, we compare ourselves to the nearest person. So uh, disturbances and artifacts and um, uh, uh, are much less and minimal so that it's very easy to uh, localize the pathology. So localization principle of bipolar recording is we call it phase reversal. 
Uh, whereas uh, the referential recording, it's like uh, we measure the amplitude of uh, one particular, uh, the, the electrical amplitude of one particular lead to some other place. Let's say these atoms speak, we compare this, uh, the, the height of this to the height of Pidru Taragala mountain. Or, or else one of these uh, lead, uh, one of the peak in knuckles, we compare to the height of uh, the atom speak. So that is refer referential recording. The drawback is that, for example, if we uh, measure the electrical activity at the right frontal lobe, so our reference could be uh, a lead in the right ear or could be on the clavicle. So when we measure the, the electrical difference from our frontal region from this, there could be many, many uh, electrode activities because we have our heart and the cardiac vector uh, direct uh, from you know left to right direction. And sometimes before we capture a particular EEG uh, abnormality, you might capture cardiac abnormality. So because of that referential recording, uh, we use only for in certain uh, special uh, situations. But some people, some uh, neurophysiologists and EEG readers, they would uh, go for referential recording. There's another, actually, there, there are many other recording systems, which I will uh, discuss in you know, later lecture series. Right, uh, again, to just to show the wave pattern, uh, the way we see, this is a wave pattern, how we see during bipolar recording. Uh, what I said, phase reversal is that, uh, well, you know, in neurophysiology, it is quite, uh, excuse me, my battery power is running low. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, in neurophysiology, to make these uh, bizarre waves more difficult, uh, they had the nomenclature also a bit uh, difficult. So, uh, any deflection goes up. Usually, we, you know, we used to call them positive, but in neurophysiology, this is a negative deflection. Right? And any uh, electrical discharge going down from your basic level, the basic uh, electrical activity, we call it a positive discharge. Uh, th there is an underlying explanation for that. Of course, I will uh, discuss in later, uh, maybe next uh, lecture. Okay, so phase reversal is something like this in bipolar recording and uh, in referential recording, the localization principle or I to find the focus is to the, the amplitude, uh, the biggest amplitude depicts the, the exact position of the electrical discharge. It comes out of your cortex. Okay, there's another name that we should uh, uh, remember or get familiar with the montages. The montages, uh, you know, the neurophysiological description, if I read it, because I can't remember yet, uh, if I read it, well, it says montage refers to the pattern of systematic linkage of the scalp electrodes designed to obtain a logical display of electrical activity. Well, it's very, it's very difficult uh, definition. So, uh, but what I understood is like, you know, uh, when now, there are certain views that we can uh, uh, have to find the special focus of the electrical activity. For example, uh, it's like this. Uh, suppose we have, we have a cake on our table. We can look at it from a side or we can look at it from the top or, you know, in which, uh, I mean, to get different, uh, and then, you know, expert would describe, okay, my, my goodness, this is a nice cake, uh, you know, nice uh, decoration and so on, uh, you know, the ladies. So uh, what I understood montage is like that. It's, it's kind of uh, the way we arrange the electrode to get the best, uh, 
you know yield out of the recording to simplify this uh, montage the word further i'll tell you if you go to google maps <coughs> excuse me so this is the usual uh, the, the you know google map we see but if you want to find the you know get more detail we, we can go to uh, the satellite view or if you want to see you know the the steepness or the the mountains we can go to the terrain view and further if you want to find facilities available like restaurants and things well we can go to another uh, view so montages are just like that and uh, we can arrange montages in many many ways but frequently arranged montage we call it double banana montage and double banana is because of it's like two bananas uh, place so this is also called quinsca uh, montage and again uh, to for postcards the even numbers on the right side dot numbers on the left side and we have a central line here to see the electrical activity uh, at the you know uh, the uh, the central areas of the cortex right so that's montages and going to base so there are mainly there are many many uh, wave patterns uh, recorded and described on our uh, cortex uh, maybe about 18 uh, wave patterns but out of those uh, frequently what we use is about four Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. We can okay. hear you and you very well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we uh, use only four uh, wave patterns out of uh, all the other frequencies in band. So alpha wave, which is also called posterior uh, dominant rhythm. Hello, something happened and we lost the screen. Yeah, can you share the screen again? Uh, we can't see the slides. So I think the speaker left the meeting. Maybe he was removed accidentally. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 we can yeah, hear you so, now. Yeah, very sorry for the interruption. 
you know, I lost okay. the, the power of my computer. Anyway. Very sorry for that. And so I was talking about alpha waves, um, uh, which also we call posterior dominant rhythm. Uh, which why we call it because uh, uh, alpha rhythm is usually uh, seen in the posterior part of the brain. Uh, <coughs> then I can't see my right. <coughs> and. Uh, so the frequency of alpha wave, you just listen to these postgraduates because um, uh, to, you know, remember this stuff, it takes time and, as, uh, you know, it's kind of, a, uh, it's very difficult to remember this, but uh, when you are starting reading EEGs, uh, you are get used to this. It's like driving a vehicle, you know, uh, when someone teaches you do this, do that, uh, it's difficult, but when you start, and uh, when you get first hand you know experience uh, you get to register these uh, frequencies in your mind automatically okay uh, alpha wave the frequency ranges between 8 to 13 hertz that is 8 to 13 uh, waves per second uh, so amplitude ranges between 20 to 60 microvolts and uh, so the alpha waves are seen easily when the patient, the, the person is in a relaxed position while the eyes are closed. And a certain number of population, like 5% of the population, they don't have alpha waves, but that is normal. And alpha uh, waves can be blocked uh, because of the, you know, uh, the mental activity like uh, even if you keep your eyes closed okay you get the alpha wave nicely but if you think about a problem uh, let's say covid or something then alpha goes off or you know uh, gentlemen so we are staying in the uh, we are sort of stuck to the home these days and we don't have any alpha waves because we have to think you know uh, <laughs> problems all the time and uh, right, so this uh, slide shows a, a nice alpha rhythm. So one particular uh, uh, feature of alpha is, uh, you know, this O2, I don't know whether you can uh, see very well. So this, uh, you've seen the posterior brain region and uh, towards the anterior brain region, alpha fades off and alpha is being replaced with the tiny beta activities, right? Here, this deflection uh, is the eye closure artifact. So here you can see the posterior lead. What you see is beta rhythm, but uh, when the eyes are closed, you uh, starting to see eye alpha rhythm. Uh, the second uh, waves that I li would like to share with you is beta waves, which are small amplitude, very frequent uh, waves, uh, range from 14 to 30 hertz. Well, and this is the most common brain wave patterns in, uh, in uh, normal people, except in the posterior regions, most of the anterior regions uh, are replaced with, uh, are dominated with beta waves. So what you see here is very frequent, high frequent, uh, cortical activity, and this is uh, a good example of beta waves. Theta waves are slow waves. So uh, this is another small problem with nomenclature in, uh, you know, neurophysiology. Why couldn't they, let's say, alpha, beta, theta, delta, so alpha is 8 hertz, beta is, let's say, 14 hertz, and Theta is again five hertz, so it confused the 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 you know beginners uh, because there's no proper uh, you know uh, uh, arrangement of this normal. Anyway, theta waves are slow waves. Theta and delta, you, you remember, theta waves and delta waves are slow, waves. and alpha waves and beta waves are a little bit faster waves. Uh, theta waves could be pathological, but it could be physiological, especially in kids and also in certain mood conditions like 
uh, with extreme displeasure, pleasure, or even drowsiness, and uh, uh, you can get theta waves recorded in the brain, in the EG. Well, uh, delta waves are the slowest waves, and uh, the frequency range between 0.5 hertz to uh, 4. And the amplitudes are very quite high. I mean, it can it goes up to 200 microvolts. These delta waves are usually pathological, but physiological delta waves you can see during uh, deep sleep, stage three or four, and uh, all, sorry, stage uh, three. And also uh, when the patient is on medications like anesthetics. And delta waves are also can be seen in uh, focal and general uh, cerebral dysfunctions and also uh, when there are structural brain lesions like uh, tumors. Uh, these slides compare uh, all those four waves that I described, the beta waves, quite high frequent uh, waves. You can see the frequency like that. And alpha waves, it, let's say, quite mid-frequent. Theta waves and delta waves are slow waves, and you can see delta waves are very large amplitude waves. Here, uh, time uh, is mentioned. With, within the one second, uh, the number of uh, you know, deflections are the frequency. Okay, so what are the indications for E? Uh, mainly, 90, let's say 90% of the time, or 80% of the time, it's to diagnose and you know, to categorize and to, uh, it's epilepsy, epilepsy management, right? So uh, in epilepsy, EGs are done to diagnose lateralization. The word lateralization means to see the focus is coming from right or left, right hemisphere or left hemisphere. And once we, let's say, this is about focal epilepsy. So if we uh, lateralize the lesion to, let's say, right side of your hemisphere, then the localization. The localization is whether it is frontal, temporal, occipital, or the, the exact location. Or diagnosis, lateralization, localization. And also, we use the EEG, especially EEG, the long duration recordings, for the quantification of electrical activity, especially to tailor the drugs and adjust the medications. Treatment response assessment. Sometimes, uh, you know, with the treatment, uh, EEG activity uh, can, you know, gradually fade off, but it's not that specific. <clears throat> also for syndromic diagnosis, especially in kids, uh, there are, you know, many, many epileptic syndromes, epileptic encephalopathies, and also, it's quite helpful sometimes for, you know, autoimmune brain diseases like encephalitis. Uh, it's a, it's a one, one uh, area where EEG is specific. Brain mapping for surgery. So this shows uh, how we map. Uh, sorry for the poor quality of the picture. The, the brain mapping to find the exact focus and guide the surgeon. Uh, let's go to another uh, story. Uh, so 45 years bank manager of a private bank came from Mount uh, He had an episode of faint business a year ago. He had no loss of consciousness, no tonicity, no chronicity, he didn't have any movement. And uh, you know the kind of questions that we ask when patients uh, give a history suggestive of epilepsy or fits. So actually, I would love if I if you also could interact with me. And uh, I mean, yeah. So uh, then uh, he had no injuries, no incontinence, and and he has gone to a clinician and. Uh, done the EEG and diagnosed frontal lobe epilepsy, put on uh, 
Valpari, sorry, Valparate for 400 grams uh, twice a day for a year. I mean, you know, he had been on a year and actually he came to uh, me to ask whether to continue medicine. So this is why, I mean, EGs, uh, sorry, the, the diagnosis of epilepsy is 95% of a clinical diagnosis. And if you get, give me a chance, and if I get a chance uh, in the future, I, I, I'll discuss the, the clinical diagnosis of epilepsy because it's very, very easy and quite sensitive, and it has a good specificity as well. I mean, there's a pattern of asking question, and uh, you can diagnose epilepsy without the EG. So, by the way, uh, nowadays uh, people tend to do EEG for anything. So they did the EEG, diagnose, control of epilepsy, put a patient. Luckily, he's a gentleman, not a, a lady who's in a fertile period. So luckily, he bought the EEG tracing that was recorded somewhere. And uh, to see <laughs> that... What you see here is a nice alpha rhythm. And these are the, uh, you know, sort of uh, sharp discharges that he, uh, the, the clinician diagnosed. Uh, what you see in the frontal leads on both sides, and these are actually eye blink artifacts, right? Mind you, these are eye blink artifacts, simple artifacts that we see almost in every GVP. And to make the, the, the diagnosis easy is that you can see a nice alpha rhythm is goes off when the eyes are open. So, I mean, he, he has been, you know, sort of blinking during the recording and this is eye blink artifact. And uh, I could easily tell of the drugs and let the fellow free of medic medicine. So, the other... Uh, Situations where EEG would help police to identify encephalopathy could be metabolic, traumatic, infective, whatever. And uh, encephalitis um, could be focal or could be generalized. And sometimes they are very, very specific. In which case, the EEG are really, really helpful to specifically diagnose certain encephalitis, which I will show you later towards the end of this uh, lecture. Traumatic brain injuries, the, the kind, like let's say a patient comes with the head trauma, cerebral contusion, and uh, then to diagnose those, uh, the functional assessment of the brain, it's important to do. And uh, sometimes raised intracranial pressures can be depicted in, uh, you know, short in uh, EEG. Assessment of degree of anesthesia. Uh, especially the management of e, uh, the, the resistant epilepsy or patients with status epilepticus. We do serial EEGs as well as uh, uh, in other countries, uh, you know, continuous uh, uh, ICU EEG monitoring. Well, sometimes uh, some dementic patients can have certain EEG abnormalities. Psychotic disorders, uh, especially to uh, exclude uh, organic pathologies, and sometimes would help to uh, diagnose uh, psychiatric diseases as well. Because especially in video telemetry, where we uh, synchronize EEG, you know, waves with the uh, the, the video recording, and uh, uh, you guys are experts on uh, you know diagnosis in these things. And uh, sleep studies, uh, that is, you know, not very uh, familiar to you, but, uh, you know, to diagnose sleep apnea, whether to tell it's a uh, central sleep apnea or quite commonly found uh, uh, these uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, rapid eye movement uh, behavior disorders, REM sleep behavior disorder. Sleep efficiency assessment to assess whether uh, one gets a good sleep or not. 
sometimes because patients come complaining they don't sleep at all but to see that their sleep uh, efficiency is very good structural brain lesions uh, i mean this is uh, in the present day i would totally omit uh, you know diagnosing structural lesions by eegs because we have magnificently developed imaging uh, you know uh, methods or so diagnosing structural brain lesions through eeg is a topic uh, uh, which was popular before 1950s well uh, Although not specific, uh, sometimes EEG is much shows tumors, infarcts, bleeds, and demyelination. But just one thing to uh, highlight: uh, tumors usually high-grade tumors shows only little EEG abnormalities, whereas low-grade tumors shows more dreadful EEG abnormalities. and please don't ask me why i don't know but that is something that we have experienced uh, with regard to tumors so if you suspect tumor please go for imaging there is a place in patients with headache that is so differentiate you know migraine occipital lobe epilepsy sometimes uh, you know this parietopolar syndrome and you know things like that so in which case uh, uh, you know the patients are coming with let's say a headache plus they get these autonomic features sometimes you are not sure whether it is migraine or is it a kind of a seizure yes of course it's quite uh, reasonable to ask for eeg okay are you okay now are you uh, tired seen uh, shall we continue no, no. like this Yes, yeah. still not confused. Can go on. <laughs> Quite clear. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, so let's look at a, a normal awake EEG because finding normality is the most difficult thing. That, as I told you, now just by looking at this, you might see well, it's quite normal, and actually it is. So here, this uh, you you can see F seven. p so these are odd numbers this uh, reflects your left hemisphere and here the you know the even numbers which uh, represent the right hemisphere so forget other areas we'll uh, try to concentrate this four you know lines this is nice alpha activity this one large uh, uh, area is one second okay so you can't see it but uh, you know in our eeg routine eeg uh, we can see each of this one large uh, distance is divided to five small sections where yeah, in this we can't see but so that one small section is 200 millisecond and this is one second so if we calculate One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So it's twelve hertz uh, alpha activity, and this alpha activity is nicely coming from the posterior head region. So we call it posterior dominant rhythm. So PDR, uh, we call it posterior dominant rhythm. The alpha activity, which is quite normal in healthy people, right? But sometimes you might. there's a chance that you might uh, let's go to the next slide yeah well this again normally eeg and you can see the eye blink artifacts uh, as i shown you earlier in that uh, the, the the clinical the scenario so these eye blink artifacts with the eye blink in most of the time is you know eyes are open so you can't see that nice uh, alpha rhythm as previously so oh, the alpha is uh, uh, overridden by beta activity right and so this is you know uh, uh, just a little uh, uh, thing to tell you our eyeballs act like a uh, electrical bipolar object so our you know the retina lies behind the eyeball 
is more negative compared to the anterior eye region, which is more positive. Okay, so uh, how I remember this was when I was supposed to, you know, the registra retina rena. So negativity in the retina and positivity in the frontal eyeball. So what happens is when you open your eyes, right, the uh, eyeball goes down. So if the frontal lead is here, the positivity goes down. Just like that, when you close your eye, you know, the due to the Bell's phenomenon, uh, although the eye is closed, the eyeball goes up. So what happens is the positivity goes towards the frontal lead here. Okay. So that shows a positive deflection. But unfortunately, in neurophysiology, positive deflections are downward deflections. So this big, large downward deflection is uh, eye closure artifact. Okay. So I hope you got it. So anyway, uh, this is eye closure artifact. And uh, here you can see another artifact. Uh, but you see here, it's like... Uh, uh, sort of, a, a, you know, the face reversal and one can mislead that these two diagnose again frontal epilepsy, but it is not the case. This actual lateral eye movement artifact, what you see is like, a, you can see a space here. Uh, so that means the patient has moved his eye to the left here. And on the right side in the same, it, you should be able to uh, appreciate there's a shrinking of the space there. So uh, here, the, the, on the right, when you get from the right side, patient has, uh, you know, the eyes has gone to the left. And here, on the left side, it shows the eyeball has gone towards the left, right? Okay, and uh, there are many other, let's say, let's go to the next one here, that, that shows, uh, See, this is a normal awake EEG, but see how many artifacts are there. Well, as I told you, I blink here, the I close artifact. And what I told you, uh, you know, the second, the lateral eye movement artifact, where was it? Oh, yeah, let's say here, the patient had looked into the left here, right? And that's why there's a space here while place the, uh, uh, I don't know whether you can see here, there, there's a very tiny spike here. Let me show it in another place. Okay, you can see a very tiny spike. This is actually, you know, one can, uh, you know, mention in it as a spike discharge, but it's the artifact of the lateral rectus, you know, the lateral rectus pulls eyeball to this side and there's a muscle artifact you see as a spike, but it's not an EG abnormality, it's an artifact. So this is why um, uh, it's very, very important to uh, identify abnormal looking normal EEG patterns. Good, so here uh, you can see eye closure artifact as I told you. Due to the Bell's phenomenon, when you close the eye, eyeball goes up. So in the frontal lead, it shows a downward or the positive deflection. When the patient is the person is uh, person's eye opens, the when you do that, the eyeball goes down. So uh, with respect to the frontal lead, the positivity goes down. That make a negative deflection. That's the upward deflection in the EEG. Okay. Right. So go to the next slide. Uh, there are, this is another thing that you should remember. Now we know the alpha uh, frequency, the posterior dominant rhythm ranges between uh, 8 hertz to 13 hertz, but uh, there are certain normal variants in alpha activity. Uh, for example, there are like uh, doublets and uh, we call it harmonics. 
uh, so uh, hope the the uh, usual alpha rhythm is uh, let's say nine hertz yeah you can see it but sometimes it can be harmonic of nine hertz that is 18 hertz but this is not abnormal this is normal and sometimes uh, uh, like uh, let's say eight hertz uh, alpha sorry alpha rhythm can be comes in a subharmonic that is you see it like uh, four hertz rhythm which is in the delta range but small amplitude but if you look carefully here now here of course the uh, the frequency looks less but if you carefully look at there are uh, you know notched alpha waves notched in the sense that they are subharmonic of eight hertz and it looks like four hertz so alpha waves are there posteriorly we call it posterior rear dominant rhythm it can come in harmonics and also it can come in subharmonics right don't worry about these terms i mean for these to be familiar it takes about three to four months you have to continuously daily see then it goes to your mind you know it absorbs to your body good now for oh, untrained eye there are spikes can you see these spikes here and here also and it looks that uh, you know like all the leads it debits mainly in the the frontal regions uh, so what do you think this is this is actually uh, if you go to the next slide sorry i don't know whether you can appreciate you can see the ecg ekg trace down here and these spikes are inter time locked to the urs complexes of the e ecg okay so uh, these are actually electrocardiographic uh, uh, the artifacts which are seen in the electroencephalogram this is because you know our the brain electrical activity when we uh, record through our skull we amplify those electrical activity to 1 million times and shown in the oscilloscope or nowadays in the uh, led screen uh, so you can imagine uh, when we amplify that this micro voltages 1 million times the surrounding electrical activities and you know magnetic fields everything being amplified then uh, put onto the screen to prevent most of those uh, artifacts we have applied the filters there is high pass filters low pass either you know uh, sirs and uh, madams uh, you must have seen you know you know this real but i am uh, talking this to post test right so we can cut off those let's say uh, while recording the ecg if the fan is uh, rotating uh, in the ceiling the the magnetic field of that fan can be depicted on the eeg so it's another lecture actually i'll talk it in the eeg artifacts in another lecture okay so um that is normal EEGs. Let's a little bit talk about abnormal EEGs. We can categorize abnormal EEGs into three main uh, sections. <coughs> yeah, abnormal EEG is mainly epileptiform abnormalities and cephalopathic coit could be due to brain injuries or structural lesions. It could be purely a form. It could be a combination of uh, either two of them or three of them. Uh, actually, when I was a registrar, one of my colleagues who's a psychiatrist now, <coughs> I was a neurology registrar, asked me, how do you define a spike and a sharp discharge? And I did, you know, I, it, just three months into neurology, I didn't know. And, uh, but, you don't have to know that because once your eyes are trained, then uh, you don't need the definition. But anyway, uh, if someone asks you, the, the sharp discharge, uh, something like this, has a very high amplitude and the base of it is less than, uh, it should be less than 200 
millisecond and more than 70 millisecond. And in a uh, spike discharge, the base is much uh, small compared to the sharp discharge. That is several less than 70 millisecond, uh, the base of the uh, spike discharge. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, uh, you can appreciate here, there are spiky, actually these are uh, epileptic form, uh, polyspike discharges. Uh, you can see, even numbers on the first two uh, uh, lines, the group of lines that is on the left hemisphere. And here the even numbers, the right hemisphere. So you can see these spike discharges on both of your hemispheres. So the term generalized means uh, it should be on the right and left both because sometimes I have seen uh, many, uh, you know, uh, people have reported EG as generalized to see that, you know, it's on the one side, but let's say frontal and occipital area you can see, but term generalized in EEG means both left and right. So the, you can see a couple of spikes come in a burst, right? In a very short, time period, like uh, let's say to in 600 microseconds, 600 milliseconds, there are three uh, spike complexes. So we call this polyspike discharges, generalized polyspikes. And uh, usually these kind of discharges are seen in uh, patients with like myoclonic epilepsy. And also the one more important thing again, one can be fooled with these spikes. Now these are actually, if you carefully see, these spiky discharges are time locked to uh, ECG uh, artifact. So actually these are ECG artifacts. So uh, this is why I always tell that, you know, the abnormal looking normal EEG is the difficult Thing to identify, but it's very easy to identify uh, the spikes and other abnormalities. And here, that's uh, odd numbers. Uh, what you see here is occipital, it's O1, O2, like that. Uh, there are sharp discharges, and actually, more than sharp, there are spike and wave discharges also. But mm, to mention you that. In the same leads, here O1, O2, in another uh, view, you see some slow discharges. Can you, can you appreciate these slow discharges? Huh? Uh, so if I see this, you know, before uh, I become, you know, I, I am used to these uh, EEGs. At the beginning, if I see this, I would say, well, there are, I believe focal epiform discharge coming from the occipital area and they're surrounding slow wave activity. So I would call, I mean, if you see a epiform activity in a surrounding slow wave, you have to specially suspect a structural lesion which is shooting these uh, electrical discharges, right? And uh, I would ask for uh, imaging. But, hmm, if you consider this slow wave, the onset of slow wave is a couple of milliseconds after the QRS complex. So what does that mean? That means the heart has, is contracted and the pulse wave has gone through the you know, occipital arteries or the temporal arteries. Probably this lead is placed on the artery. So what, what happens is it's a pulse artifact. Can you see the pulse artifact, which is couple of milliseconds after the QRS complex. Okay, so actually uh, train is, uh, you know, if you are sitting, you know, by the side with me and read the CG, I would have explained you keep in a ruler also, you can, you know, you can time lock, you can compare the time uh, lag between the ECG and the, these artifacts. So we have to be very, very careful the abnormal looking normal EGs. Okay, uh, I think um, 
uh, Vipula uh, sent this patient uh, last week. Actually, he clearly asked me, is it absent Jesus? I said, yes. So what you see here is, in the morning only, I, <laughs> I put this slide here. There's very nice spike and wave, generalized spike and wave discharges. Uh, once you used your uh, eye to this, now, this is a one second, and you can clearly see there are three discharges here. One, two, three. Those are spike and wave discharges. And of course, this, uh, this nice three hertz generalized spike wave discharges means it's an idiopathic uh, epilepsy. Idiopathic generalized epilepsy. And with the history, probably patient may be having staring episodes or abnormal uh, sort of uh, behavioral episodes. And it was very clear. Uh, and thank you, Vipula. You, you just asked me if there is absence. He says, yes, it is. So this again shows spike and wave uh, nicely. You see the spike and wave, spike, wave, right? So this is three hertz. That, you know, within a one second, between these two lines, it's one second. You can see here also. So there are three nice discharges. And this is quite specific, quite clear. Well, bloom, uh, it's epilepsy. So um, here you can see uh, again polyspike discharges coming. And patient had been in sleep because uh, later you will get to know these are like uh, we call them uh, uh, in stage two sleep. Uh, we see these uh, large, uh, you know, kind of uh, discharges. Uh, right. This is polyspike discharge, probably a patient with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Uh, and it, again, it's quite specific comparing with the history. If the patient is uh, telling well in the morning when I take the cup of tea that was thrown away, uh, you know, it was sort of myoclonic jerks that the patient is getting phenotypically. With that history, if I see this, yes, it is general myoclonic epilepsy. But to name that uh, syndrome, we have to be very, very careful when we diagnose in this. Uh, because once we diagnose juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, the treatment is lifelong. So uh, if we diagnose JME to a, let's say, artifact or, uh, you know, uh, some mistake, uh, the, uh, there's a danger that a uh, patient can be put on uh, anti-epileptics for the life. The danger is once, once someone is put on the medication or the patient, I mean the Patient also would be reluctant to take the medicine off. And any other clinician also is reluctant to take the medi uh, you know, medicine off. Sometimes EG could be normal. And uh, when you talk about the history, it could not be epilepsy. But, you know, uh, who want to take a risk? I mean, if the patient has got uh, epileptic attack due to some other reason, or oh, might he, he can turn back? Okay, and uh, this again shows uh, uh, spike and wave discharge. What I wanted to show there are, uh, you know, what we call that uh, during recording of EEGs, there are uh, methods that we can uh, pronounce or we can increase the deal of. Uh, discharges by various methods uh, like hyperventilation or photic stimulation, sleep deprivation, that kind of thing. So uh, what you see here, here is the photic uh, uh, stimulation uh, with the photic pressure. The frequency of flash here is about, uh, about six hertz. And uh, the photic stimulation has enhanced this uh, spike and wave discharges. So it is generalized epilepsy. And uh, the photic stimulation has helped to create the, the epileptic discharge and diagnose the disease. Uh, another quite commonly identified uh, uh, epilepsy 
you know, variety of epilepsies, uh, benign Rolandic epilepsy. Now we call benign childhood epilepsy with centrotemporal spikes. Now you can see this is C, the, the central leads, uh, frontocentral, parietocentral leads, there are spike discharges, uh, especially in this lead. And uh, also in temporal leads, also you can uh, uh, appreciate the spike discharges. And this being a, a bipolar recording, uh, the, the localization principle is phase reversal. You can see nice phase reversal. That is a positive deflection and negative deflection meets in one place. Okay. And uh, I mean, we, we can talk uh, days about it. Uh, it's a very interesting thing, uh, but uh, we'll take it to another because uh, the, the benign Rolandic epilepsy is benign, but nowadays uh, 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 there's a, it's not as benign as earlier thought. And uh, we see this commonly in uh, all the children and uh, teenagers below. 15 years. Okay. Again, this shows a central and a temporal spiky discharges of a patient with uh, benign epilepsy uh, with central temporal spikes. Okay. And here, uh, sometimes the previously mentioned abnormalities are actually interictal abnormalities that the patient has had the uh, fits earlier and uh, you uh, uh, patient is being referred and uh, we see after waves of the previous insult that's uh, we call them interictal discharge right but sometimes uh, we uh, while we are doing this let's say routine EG sometimes patient get uh, ictal discharges and the patient is getting uh, maybe only the electrical seizure or else patient can get a real seizure with clinical uh, presentation. And what you see here is evolution of a seizure. Just to elaborate, uh, the evolution of the uh, seizure is that first it's like integral discharges, you get these nice spikes and wave discharges. And that is integral, but the evolution is, it becomes a tiny, very high frequency discharge, evolve into a, uh, the frequency veins of, but the amplitude goes up as the, uh, the seizure progress, the electrical uh, seizure progress, right? So, uh, the, in the evolution of electrical seizure, what you see here is, very high frequent discharge becoming less frequent, but the small discharge become bigger, right? So uh, during the evolution, the amplitude goes up and frequency goes down. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is just, just to get your attention later, we can discuss about this uh, non-convulsive uh, epilepsy, convulsive epilepsy, status epilepticus and so on. And this shows, uh, well, the even numbers, right side, uh, phase reversal to the temporal region. What is SP2 is sphenoidal lead. You know, sometimes anterior and inferior temporal discharges might not be picked up in uh, temporal cortex, right? In which case, uh, in special situation, if you really, really want to uh, find the uh, deep-seated uh, electrical discharges in the, let's say, initial temporal area, we can put a needle electrodes to the uh, sphenoidal sinus from here and capture those discharges. So SP means a sphenoidal lead. So right side, uh, entero-inferior temporal discharge. And uh, this shows again, actually it's a seizure. Now this electrical seizure that is captured in, uh, uh, during the recording. The evolution I can show you, just concentrate on these two lines. 
the lead in that's the lead the, the for the mid right mid temporal lead shows very high frequent small discharge uh, that's a b you know more than beta actually uh, that's the start of the seizure and as it progresses the amplitude goes up and frequency wanes off so this is a very nice example of a focal you know electrographic seizure and maybe uh, you know these kind of situations clinically maybe uh, the the patient uh, patient's relatives would complain sometimes a patient is uh, you know having abnormal sort of unresponsive episodes and uh, which uh, he, the the patient uh, uh, is not responding to surrounding uh, you know questions or uh, its abnormal behaviors Well, as psychiatrists, you get quite commonly these kind of people, right? Uh, just to show you, <clears throat> this is a recording of a, a kid. Actually, in kids, uh, especially before three months of age, uh, three months old, uh, where usually you don't get this. I'm sorry that you don't get these uh, young patients, but. very young uh, kids this could be a normal thing but uh, with the uh, careful examination uh, and especially with the history uh, you know the salam attacks uh, the hip arrhythmia we call you can see these are actually uh, slow wave discharges but i don't know whether you can appreciate there's a hidden tiny spike here right so this is a spike and wave discharge it comes in about 2.5 hertz very chaotic uh, this is a, in a patient with hip arrhythmia with a you know hip arrhythmia very poor prognosis they can later develop into epileptic encephalopathy and uh, yeah good and this slide shows uh, actually these are spikes coming in very regular intervals could it be electrocardiographic artifact well if you consider this line uh, one might think like that but it's not the case it is not always time locked to uh, ekg artifact and uh, and there's no background with them uh, the posterior alpha rhythm is gone so uh, this pattern we call it generalized periodic epileptic form discharge uh, usually you see in these kind of uh, egs in uh, critically ill patients with a lot of cortical damage uh, and there's a very high chance of getting treats and the prognosis of the patient is quite poor and we see this kind of uh, eegs in icu setup okay now compared to this one as i told you earlier left side right side so both sides in all we call it generalized Uh, the term but this one you can see uh, spike and wave discharges on the left temporal region the even numbers but we don't see it on the right temporal region again left parietal region also you can see so these are periodic lateralized epileptic form discharges uh, that means the focus is uh, it's a focal fit and there's a very high chance the patient can uh, get uh, fits right and also uh, hidden to these sharp discharges there are slow background here and that is something that uh, you know uh, make me think in uh, the possibility of a structural lesion or let's say focal uh, encephalitis triggering these uh, spike discharges so in which case i would ask for uh, imaging and cf studies and all and also the the dangerous thing is and i mean the the most important thing for you is these people can come with behavioral abnormalities to you partially investigated in medical or neurological uh, you know uh, uh, scenario and uh, they might uh, you know refer to you okay this could could this be psychiatric and uh, to see that uh, it could be quite well organic right again it this shows a periodic uh, uh, generalized periodic epileptic form discharges and the, this classic pattern is seen in crotsfeld jacot syndrome a disease 
the Kuru disease, uh, where the prions are the culprit. Uh, that again, another you know, a nice area to discuss, but uh, not now. Uh, this one again generalized uh, polyspite discharges uh, shown in sub, uh, subacute sterosine pan encephalitis, uh, post measles, you know, uh, in your medical uh, years, uh, you must have that. Right. So we discuss about epileptiform discharges, the sharp patterns. Now uh, let's move on to slow patterns. Uh, Gihan, are you tired? Are you okay? No, no, we are not tired. Do you can go on? <laughs> okay, I mean, if it, I, if it is boring, let me know. I mean, you can stop here oh. and uh, we can have some discussion or we can do it another day. Not at all, no. Okay, right. Mm. Right, so slow patterns we can um, subdivide into focal or generalized. So, um, and also there are very, very specific discharges, very, very specific uh, EG patterns, which are clearly defined the disease. So this is the fascination, fascinating thing in EGs. I mean, usually in uh, sharp discharges, the sensitivity is less. If we say in a routine EG, the chance of detecting an abnormal uh, spike or epileptiform discharge, is about 30%, but we can increase it to 60% if we do the second and third EEG, if we repeat the EEG in a couple of days time. Uh, and also we can increase the yield by other activation procedures like sleep deprivation and all. Okay, but slow discharges are quite sensitive, but less specific. But there are certain instances where EEG can be very, very helpful to diagnose certain treatable conditions, right? Now here, uh, we don't see alpha rhythm, but there are quite slow discharges in the range of delta and theta, especially delta. And what you see uh, the odd numbers, uh, compared to even numbers, even you know on the right side also there are some slowness, but not as clear as left side, right? So as EEG re reader, I would call this prominently slow on the left hemisphere. So it's a focal slowing. The slowing that we seen on the right side could be due to the you know the closeness of the uh, the, the cortex. And sometimes the electrical vector can be reflected on the other side as well. Right? But there are methods where you can uh, uh, exactly see whether it is left or right. right? So this is focal uh, slow activity and uh, mostly seen on the left side. So this could jolly well be uh, encephalitis or a structural lesion. Again, here what you see is e electro you know, ECG artifacts and uh, uh, again, just to remind again, identifying artifact is important. And this one, well, it looks like uh, sharp discharges, isn't it? Like, uh, so we see on the uh, right side, especially this is a different montage, actually headband montage uh, being displayed here. Uh, we are used to see double banana montage, but this is another view where the electrodes are placed uh, around your head and we call it a headband uh, montage and average reference uh, recording. Okay. But mind you, uh, you know, trained, I can diagnose this is a slow, generalized slow discharge. Uh, but one can argue why can't this be uh, epileptiform discharge looks sharp discharge, but it is not the case because epileptiform discharges should come. I mean, usually within, I mean, uh, it is time lock both sides, so there's no difference in time. There's no, uh, so if you see a spike on the right side in the same column, in the same time, you can see it on the left side as well, at least maybe a microsecond difference. But here, if you um, if you, uh, I don't know, you can entertain, uh, yeah, there's a time lag, uh, even in the, 
on the certain the right hemisphere the frontally discharge or the frontal sharp looking slow discharge compared to the occipital discharges has come quite early about uh, 200 milliseconds earlier right so uh, one important thing to differentiate from uh, epileptic from discharge from this triphasic slow discharge is time lag okay and also if you carefully look at, look at these uh, uh, let's say let's take uh, which one yeah let's take this uh, slow activity here you can see upward deflection a negative deflection positive deflection and again another negative deflection so this is a triphasic slow discharge slow activity right so biphasic and triphasic uh, slow activity uh, is quite uh, commonly seen in metabolic encephalopathies like uh, maybe patient has chronic kidney disease chronic liver disease uh, you know alcoholics comes to you uh, yeah alcoholics comes to you and um, you know so with metabolic derangement either electrolyte or whatever the pathology uh, you have to do uh, clear metabolic screening well and this shows uh, i mean a very very slow polymorphic uh, delta dis uh, the the activity and uh, this is severe encephalopathy okay and that again shows a uh, severe encephalopathic pattern which could be ischemic or which could be severe cortical damage due to encephalitis and so on and this is uh, quite uh, Rarely seen the birth suppression pattern. Usually, the the psychiatrist would not see this because this is seen in ICU setup. There are bursts of uh, spiky epileptiform discharges, and there's a area of suppression, right? So, in two main clinical scenarios, we can see them. Uh, one thing is uh, severe cortical damage. The you know the vegetative state. Uh, the uncontrolled cortical activity can lead to this kind of burst and then suppressed cortical activity. Uh, at the beginning, something that I couldn't tell you is that we have a rhythmicity in our brain waves, the electrical activity. The pacemaker for that rhythm is supposed to be, uh, they believe that it is the thalamo, thalamus, uh, thalamocortical uh, pathways and, uh, you know, the the uh, nucleus reticularis of the thalamus. Uh, but, you know, it's a theory, not uh, very well understood, like, uh, you know, SA node uh, or, you know, the uh, heart. The brain uh, pacemaker is supposed to be those thalamocortical and nuclear reticularis connections. So, uh, in a patient with uh, severe brain damage, in a vegetative state, this um, the, the the pacemaker activity is gone so the cortex fire the dying cell fire by its own that leads to this burst pattern and uh, the usual the cortical dead pattern is you don't see any electrical activity and this is a electrical silent area there's a one scenario the other scenario is you know a patient comes with status epilepticus and we put the patient on medicine and maybe we had to anesthetize the patient, uh, giving, you know, this uh, halothane and, you know, the, the other, not halothane actually, the anesthetic agent and you subsidize the cortical activity to the minimal level. Uh, so in deep anesthesia also, you can see the burst suppression. And uh, so we must make sure uh, before diagnosing brain dead, uh, whether the patient is on, uh, high sedatives, intravenous, things like that. Okay, again, it shows the burst and suppression, the burst suppression pattern. Okay, in this uh, slide, you can see uh, quite uh, a normal looking alpha activity in the posterior region, posterior dominant rhythm is there. So this is not cortical dysfunction. This is not encephalopathy. Uh, that's something that, you know, we can discuss later, uh, you know, 
the alpha alpha the posterior dominant rhythm implies the patient's cortical activity is normal the pacemaker is working so the patient should be walking around right and but you can see in the frontal leads if on both sides the even or right in the frontal and frontotemporal leads, you can see uh, slow activity, the delta activity, but they comes in rhythms, not continuous. Intermittent uh, rhythmic delta activity in frontal leads. Sometimes in short term, we call it further, frontal intermittent rhythmic delta activity. This is a, a, a feature of raised intracranial pressure. Sometimes it could be idiopathic raised intracranial pressure, or it could be blockade somewhere in the third ventricle in the uh, brain. Right. In which case, if I see this, I would uh, ask to image as well as to the CSF manometry. Similar kind of abnormality, uh, rhythmic uh, delta activity uh, can be seen in temporal leads, especially here in the right temporal. Uh, so it's not generalized, it's focal to the lateralized to the right side, right? Well, this slow activity is the temporal intermittent rhythmic delta activity. Again, it could be reflected by rest intracranial pressure, as well as since there's a focal, uh, you know, uh, abnormal electrical activity, there's a high chance uh, there could be a structural lesion, uh, as well as third, uh, temporal intermittent rhythmic delta activity. If we see this, there's a high chance of uh, the patient getting fits. So one might empirically uh, start anti-epileptics. Uh, yeah. Okay, not like other delta activities. Now, if we go to this one, it's a 19-year-old, uh, uh, you know, patient. We see this nice delta rhythm, and we don't see any uh, posterior rhythmic alpha activity. So this is severe encephalopathy or encephalitis. But if you look at this blue line, we can see the delta activity. Let's say, yeah, it's a nice, uh, about 1.5 hertz delta activity. Overriding the delta activity, there's a very high frequent brush-like thing. There's a beat activity coming over the delta activity and we call it delta brush. Delta brush is quite specific to autoimmune encephalitis, especially M NMDA receptor antibody encephalitis. So if you see this, yes, click. We are quite sure. Right, this again, see a brush. We, what could it be? You know, I, I, I would be really, you know, enjoying uh, if you can answer, but this being a Zoom meeting, uh, we can't interact. But, you know, if you compare this brush, here and uh, the beat activity here that again looks like a brush but this you believe it's a telephone artifact right uh, while recording the eg the patient's uh, you know mobile has been working okay uh, right and can you tell me so uh, there is a nice positive dominant rhythm and we don't see I mean, the, even if there's a, a sharp discharge or spike wave discharge that has been hidden by this uh, big chaotic muscle artifact. Uh, so although there's a rhythm, this is not epileptic, this is actually true in artifact. The you know, patient has beaten something uh, while recording the EEG. But again, you know that we, if we apply uh, high pass filters, uh, we can take these muscle artifacts off. And if there's any uh, electrical abnormality underlying the muscle light effect, we can diagnose. But when we put the filters, there are no uh, elect, you know, epileptic form abnormality seen. Okay. Um, right. What you see here is, uh, it, it looks like, uh, you know, spike wave, or I would say polyspike and sharp discharge, but it's not the case. These are K complexes in, in uh, stage two sleep, right? And the, you know, the sleep artifacts is another topic that we can discuss a day, right? Because uh, during stage one and two sleep, you get central, uh, you know, sharp discharges. Uh, 
I mean, which can mislead uh, someone uh, taking it as a PFP form discharge. And these K, -K complexes, uh, they are normal, uh, quite healthy K complexes in uh, stage two sleep. Okay, so we'll disc uh, stop for the moment uh, talking about sleep. Otherwise, I would, you know, talk about sleep a day. Uh, just one more thing uh, for experts that, um, you know, benign epilepsy with uh, benign backs, the benign Rolandic seizures, the patient get, uh, you know, central discharges. And to make the matter worse, the benign Rolandic seizures get uh, when the usually when the the child is sleeping so that the, so that that we have to be very careful uh yeah right so how do you advise for a patient to come for eeg ask them to come with a clean scalp wash the scalp very well not to apply oils uh, and no stimulant like coffee or coca cola and uh, in sleep deprivation, I uh, told you how to advise the patient minimum of the maximum of four hours sleep only. And I would much, much be happy if a good history is written when you ask for EG. Actually speaking, I mean, from a history itself, we can diagnose um, almost 90% whether it's a fit or not, right? But there are exceptions. Okay, uh, maybe you're bored now. So we go to another story. A 60 years old lady with abnormal movements of hand uh, and face, right? Uh, and we did the EEG. Actually, this is a patient uh, uh, that came to me when I was working in Queens, Calanda. Now I am going to play this video. You carefully look at the left side of the body of the patient, the face and the arm, right? Oh. You can then see it again. Yeah, and one more time to show you because yeah, we, we could, could not see the video. You can't see the video. No, no, no. Uh, how can I? I think you had to uh, get the slide off and then put the video. I think. Okay. Uh, okay. It's a nice video. Video for. We still see the slide. Okay, okay. Give me a couple of seconds. You know, kids have a lot of videos. They are, you know, this uh, game video. So I'm finding it difficult to find my uh, clinical videos. Give me one second. Yeah. So I think I'll have to here. Yeah. Sorry for the delay. Okay. Yeah, can you see it now? Gihan, can you not, see? No, 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 not yet. No. How can I share this to you? How mm. can I share this to you? So, shall we forget the video then? But it's a very nice, uh, typical video. I think you have to go back to the share screen and uh -huh. post the video. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, now can you see? Yeah. No, not yet. No, no, no. So no. still we see the slides. Puta. Puta. So, uh, you. Do you have the video saved to your computer? It's in the computer. Uh, okay, probably I can share it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now can. Now, can you see? Ah, yes. yes, we can see now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Give the attention to the left side of the body. Could you appreciate the left uh, upper limb and the face? Yeah, okay. So, that's great. Uh, let's go to the topic again. Okay. Right. Yeah. Can you see the slide, uh, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can see. Yes. Okay. Okay. Fine. So what you saw was that uh, you know, uh, so I can't see myself now. We can see you and hear you. Okay, but uh, I want to see myself. Okay, right. So the patient got something like this, uh, uh, the this kind of beak-like hand posturing and the face was going like, can you see that? Yeah, like that. So it's an involvement of arm and the face, the one side of the body, we call it brachiofacial dystonic uh, reaction, right? So we call it actually a facial brachial uh, dystonic seizure and we did the eeg uh, it was normal right so this i am telling the clinical you know the if you see the patient uh, uh, it, it's extremely important because this eeg is normal but this typical pattern the arm and uh, face posturing uh, leads to a diagnosis of facial brachial dystonic chaser, which is an autoimmune disease. Auto antibodies produce again voltage gated calcium chan channels, right? And they respond very well to immunotherapy, immunoglobulins followed by immunosuppression and prednisolone. So, uh, uh, EEG abnormality is almost nil, only in about 1 to 4 percent people can with. Uh, uh, these encephalitis get EEG abnormalities. So the message I wanted to give you was nowadays, uh, you know, everybody has smartphones. So sometimes it is important to ask the patient's relative to get, you know, capture a video or the, the clinical presentation of the patient and more than seeing the EEG. So I would ask everyone uh, for your patients, if a patient describes some abnormal movement or behavior, ask your relatives to record that in the smartphone and bring it to your clinic and uh, that will give quite a clear idea, right? Uh, th this is a very particular good example for that. Okay, and uh, having talked about, talk a lot about, oh, sorry. Uh, these yeah, slow abnormalities, this again shows very chaotic uh, 1.5 hertz uh, polymorphic delta discharges generally, right? Oh, I would love, love to hear your answer regarding this. So looking at this, it looks uh, encephalopathic, severe encephalopathy, but mind you, uh, we recorded this EEG on this jelly ball, right? So. So brain is like a jelly, very plastic. 
and uh, uh, in this jelly with a very micro movement so you know uh, the uh, you can imagine it creates electrical activity so uh, doing knees reading knees has to be very careful if it goes to a you know wrong person like uh, uh, the the knife uh, with the monkey and uh, you can damage patients uh, and you can make new stories with you know normal patients okay so uh, it's this is why you know, what the message i wanted to uh, you know send was learn eeg it's very uh, easy to learn uh, then eeg because identifying abnormal patterns is easier than identify normal pattern so 90% of eeg learning and eeg teach, teaching is to identify abnormal looking normality and as well as eeg artifacts the artifacts could be biological artifacts or environmental artifacts right so if you remember this stuff is enough for post graduates right side uh, is depicted by even numbers left side is depicted by odd numbers and remember these frontal temporal parietal and occipital cortical areas with their letters well uh, develop skills to identify abnormal looking normal patterns and artifacts and 95% of the epileptic diagnosis is clinical actually it's a very interesting area Yeah, we'll talk uh, if we get a time later. And smartphone nowadays is a very powerful tool in diagnosing uh, epilepsy. Okay, thank you very much. Are you okay, guys? <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. <laughs> Mukherjee, for that uh, very interesting presentation. And uh, we ne never get bored. Uh, may, we never got bored with your presentation. So uh, it's. Uh, i'm sure there are there'll be several people wanting to ask you questions would you entertain any questions <clears throat> do i would have to like push any buttons here for them to ask questions no i don't think so no ah, okay no maybe they are confused so why they don't have any questions so you had uh, <laughs> quite a quite a large audience we had uh, 95 people listening to you Oh, so <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so being a Sunday morning, I didn't think that that much of crowd will be attracted to your presentation. So it's really great that we had such a large audience, including several experienced and very very senior psychiatrists. Yeah, uh, listening to you, senior lecturers. Yeah, yeah, my teachers probably. Yes, probably yes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah and uh, dr alan basing uh, dr prodigo dr yeah. piani madam yeah. yes yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, they have a uh, quite hey, lot of sir, training uh, this is uh... hello Go on. hello sir uh, yeah. Hello. yeah this is one registrar dr hera uh, mm -hmm. uh, of course the presentation was really good and we really learned a lot but very very basic thing i Uh, I need to clarify. Mm -hmm. Can you just? Sometimes I find it difficult to. Uh, I mean, still I think a little tough at times to identify spike and wave because that's the most hallmark of identifying here. So, yeah. like, uh, can you please uh, uh, just uh, yeah uh, try to brief a little bit uh, on identifying the spike and wave from a normal uh, pattern at times? Yeah, It's difficult. Yeah. Uh, well, let's go to. Okay, uh, let's go here now. Yeah, this is a normal. Can you uh, appreciate the normal looking EEG? Actually, it's not that normal, but uh, let's say uh, beta activity is predominant, but occasional some alpha activity, and it has gone into a. a can you see spike here and wave? and compared to the yeah. surrounding activity the spike is quite high amplitude right uh, let's say mm, so 
me go to another slide. Uh, okay. Let's go to Ebola's patient. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. This one. Uh, can you see the the normal health act? Very nice normal health activity. It's about one, two, three, four. It's about eight hertz. Uh, you know, alpha theta range. And but suddenly the very high amplitude compared to the amplitude here. And you know, a tiny wave here, and compared to that, can you see the big, large uh, the, the spike? I mean, it's like a giant uh, with a uh, you know uh, normal man. So it's not difficult spikes or sharp discharges. What is difficult to identify is now. Can you see here? It's a you know eye blink artifact. Uh, the the the. The thing that is difficult to identify is not the magnitude or the, the shape of the spike or spike wave. It's not the thing difficult to identify. The, the thing to, difficult to identify is to differentiate this uh, abnormal activity from abnormal looking normal activity, you know. And to learn that, of course, you have to have first hand, you know, experience. You, you must uh, read the. Now, now, just to tell you, during my neurology uh, training with Dr. Indran Lijayavira, and uh, he gave me two books, and uh, I read, I went through, oh my goodness, I'm not very good in reading books. Then I slowly kept the bigger book aside and found a small book, and then I went through it again. I couldn't, uh, you know, sort of make it out, and what happened was, uh is a very good teacher and uh you know when he was reading the EGs, you know on the table is on this side and i'm on the opposite side he gave give me the eg reading first the paper eg you know those days and uh i'm going through it and you know i write my interpretation with the pencil on the last page of the book and i give it to sir so he will go through it and he correct me. He show the normality abnormality. And just like this, uh, after neurology, once I go to neurophysiology, for about a year, nearly a year, every day in the morning, uh, I had to, uh, you know, uh, write a summary, either EG, EMG, whatever, and uh, Dr. Sudat Gunasekara was my uh, neurophysiology teacher and he, dedicated one hour of his every morning uh, for me to discuss those uh, you know the wave patterns and you know electrical stuff uh, and so on so well it took me uh, to get some confidence uh, at least six months uh, every day reading EG. so uh, it's it's something like uh, swimming you have to experience and the experience should be uh, with a very good, uh, what do you call that, uh, responsibility. I mean, when you handle a patient by your own, the responsibility is on you of the, the patient's life. Then, you know, you are, your mind is being said to, well, I must uh, look at this in this view. You know, the, the whole patient's, uh, you know, the life is in my hand. So if you read the EEG in that sense, with that uh, responsibility, will you start learning EEGs? So uh, basically, it's a high amplitude. If I tell about the amplitude, it goes above 200 microvolt, and uh, the the spike is the duration is less than 70 micros milliseconds. The wave, which is followed by the spike, is quite large. It's about uh, let's say 400 to 600 milliseconds, and high amplitude. But, uh, you know, telling that, uh, I don't think it will go to your mind. You have to read DGs, you know. Uh, you can uh, even uh, come to my EG room and, you know, nowadays digital EGs, you can go to EG and write something, uh, let's say, in a book. You take an exercise book and, okay, number one, name of the patient. This is my conclusion. At this time, let's say uh, 13 minutes, uh, 28 seconds to the EG tracing, there is this abnormality query. So something like that, uh, you know, I, I can help uh, after, uh, you know, uh, 
discuss in a time. Hello. Thank you, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Any? Hello, sir. Hello. Sir, uh, is there early reduction in alpha activity in Alzheimer dementia compared with other dementias? Well, uh, both Alzheimer's and Lewy body dementias can, uh, uh, you know, attenuate the background, the, the posterior dominant rhythm. But it's not that sensitive and it's not, uh, you know, specific. But if you really suspect uh, Alzheimer's with clinical features, and if the patient is not having any other like uh, metabolic derangements like liver, kidney, diabetes, you know, like that, if those are normal, and with this, uh, uh, you know, attenuation of background, the posterior dominant rhythm in a patient with uh, dementia, yeah, we can uh, push forward to that diagnosis, but it's not that specific in case of dementias. But dementias, again, you know, patient with, uh, especially for you, get, uh, you know, visual hallucinations and dementia, and it could be jolly well, uh, uh, baby body dementia. But it's not specific. Yeah, you have to sort of uh, take it in a cumulative uh, diagnosis, like a clinical plasma, you know, blood and EG. But you can support the diagnosis. Are you happy with that? So, um, so uh, it's one of our MCQ stems for mm -hmm. uh, that kind of a stem. What should our approach be, sir? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the question you answered. Can, can you read the question again, please? Uh, so the question is to false regarding Alzheimer dementia. Mm -hmm. And the stem is early reduction in EEG alpha activity seen in Alzheimer dementia than other dementias. Yes. But, you know, the, the question is, not that accurate. When you say other dementia, I mean, everybody also can cause the same attenuation. But I, if I answer that, I would answer yes. But I know whether the seminar give uh, me correct or not, but that's the answer. In Alzheimer's dementia, yeah, you can get early uh, alpha uh, attenuation. And uh, in EG wise, in that kind of patients, for your clinical thing, I mean, uh, it's better to have a, a repeated EEG, let's say in uh, three months apart or so, on, so that in serial EEGs, we can see earlier there was a nice self activity. Well, uh, with the disease progression, it is attenuating and the posterior dominant rhythm is going off. So, serial EEG is very important in that case. And, uh, you know, ideally, uh, the, those EG should be recorded and kept. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Yeah, any more questions? Uh, Mr. Mr. President, uh, sir, yes. uh, Dr. Gyan, may uh, I think uh, we have arranged another lecture next uh, yeah, Sunday, so, no? Yeah, yeah. So we can uh, now. What yeah, time yeah. will it be convenient yeah. for you for the next Sunday, thirteenth of June? Can, can I uh, recheck and reschedule it? Uh, if I, uh, today itself, I'll give a call to you. Ah, yeah, that that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, yeah because yeah. Uh, anyway, it's better that we have the second one before we uh, when our memories are fresh about the EG. Rather than yeah, yeah, later yeah. in the month. Yeah, yeah uh, you know, uh, I, I'll so discuss I with you uh, in the evening and we'll fix That's it. That's fine. Yeah. So if it's uh, if Sunday evening is better for you, that's fine with us because uh, yeah. or Saturday evening or whichever. Okay, Saturday, Saturday or Sunday. It's uh, ah, okay. okay. Anyways, in a night would be okay, no? I mean, even in the daytime, the, the yeah. working day. Uh, somewhere that's around, fine, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, nine in the night, uh, something like that. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
that's okay. uh, that will be all right because we know that you're really busy you're going all around the country so uh, it's, uh, <laughs> you just give us a time these days of we'll, because of covid yes. uh, i happen to be in the home anyway yeah because we are going to have a uh-huh. lecture on the 27th of june by okay. uh, professor kurkumar achi who is the uh, the chair professor of uh, the university of kalania in okay. uh, of psychiatry on epilepsy and psychiatry what psychiatry should know so i think your lecture before that will be really helpful uh, before we listen to him on the 27th of june I so think, if you can uh, in my point of view i am in the safe side if that lecture can be heard by me and make my <laughs> presentation <laughs> <to the lecture. laughs> yeah professor kuru kwarachi is very interested in uh, neuropsychiatry yeah, yeah, and yeah. epilepsy in uh, okay especially okay. epilepsy so right. and and uh, if you can uh, sort of guide me what kind of uh, aspect in eeg wise uh, you want me to talk i mean uh, maybe electrical stuff may not be necessary yeah uh, maybe technical I think, stuff uh, mm. i don't think we need the technical side yeah. much so uh, in the next to, lecture uh, shall we discuss uh, through uh, clinical uh, you know scenarios a small lecture like uh, then yeah. i can uh, tell about the you know the uh, semiology and how to clinically diagnose a uh, you know patient with epilepsy yeah so It's if okay. you can really uh, now as you told that uh, now as we are going to have a lecture on the 27th of june on epilepsy and psychiatry so if you can mm-hmm. give us a brief outline about how to clinically diagnose uh, epilepsy and what are the 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 order of the questions yeah. that we should ask from our patients that will that will be really nice because we have quite a lot of dilemma in between uh, yeah. uh, differentiating epilepsy with uh, non epileptic seizures so um, that okay. will be really nice okay Uh, i'll tell few uh, things but you can interrupt yeah. me right right uh, in a normal let's say in epilepsy clinic uh, what we learn uh, when i was a you know neurologist is to make this fit whether it is a real fit or a pseudo fit certain indicators like um, the the we can ask uh, the phenomenology whether it started from you know one hand and then propagated to the other side you know in the medical time we learned all that but uh, there are more important things than that for example if a patient complain uh, the he got a thumb bite or, or a ma- injury i mean let's say uh, fallen and got a real uh, you know uh, wound or something quite suggestive because no one wants to bite his thumb by his own i mean when you are conscious right that's one thing uh, the second thing is uh, the autonomic failures that is uh, in con- urinary and fecal incontinence that is very suggestive of uh true epilepsy uh the thing uh, third thing is the responsiveness of the patient during the seizure so that you have to ask from the uh, relatives and the fourth thing is to support the third uh, question the, the responsiveness of the patient during the fit you can clarify with smartphone you can ask the you know relatives to get a video and that will be very very helpful and uh, the fifth thing is the the frequency and the the occurrence of uh, those fits for example now for in psychiatrist perspective uh, you might be in a difficult situation to identify complex absences from a temporal lobe epilepsy right when you say absences uh there are many types of absences like simple absences absences with atonia absences with hypotonia absences with myoclonia like that right and uh, the temporal lobe seizures also they get this sometimes uh, you know like that you know unresponsiveness episode of uh, you know going blank uh, like that or in which case absence and epilepsy the frequency of occurring seizures is very important to us now 
if the uh, if those blank episodes are very frequent uh, say a couple of times a day that is more suggestive of absence seizures than uh, temporal lobe epilepsy because temporal lobe epilepsy usually the frequency is like uh, two to three uh, maybe around three to four attacks per month uh, but if the patient is telling okay uh, or the relatives are telling he get these attacks a couple of times a day that is more in favor of uh, absence seizures than temporal lobe epilepsy and again, as I told you earlier, like, you know, marching and the focal epilepsy, and even the video I showed you, you know, the facial brachial dystonic seizures, the seizure simulogy is very important. Uh, and sometimes this stereotypy of uh, clonic uh, or tonic movements, right? Uh, that's another actual discussion, uh, how to identify pseudo seizures from uh, true seizures. Uh, you must be day to day seeing these patients with, you know, bizarre movement uh, on the bed, uh, which is not stereotype. Stereotype means a very rhythmic, a very similar type of movement, right? But, you know, non stereotype is, you know, this hand shake like that, that hand like that. So, and sometimes face. So, I mean, that sort of movement cannot be put on to any seizure simulogy of true seizures. Uh, that again can be supported by this ambulatory EG, but unfortunately, as I told you earlier, we can't uh, do ambulatory EGs in Sri Lanka because our people might vanish with the machine. But in which case, this uh, the video in with the smartphone is very important, and uh, that is one thing. Uh, so basically, the frequency of seizure semiology, uh, incontinence, thumb bite, and you know, uh, having injuries are quite suggestive of uh, true seizures. And to make the, met the, the question uh, more complicated, uh, the uh, pseudo seizures occurring in patients with true seizures is quite frequent. So just by seeing one, uh, you know, the simulogy of uh, pseudo seizure, we can't exclude true seizure. Uh, yeah, the, uh, that is another entity, pseudo seizures occurring in true seizures. So basically that's the idea. Yeah. So thank you very much then. Um, I think I can avoid I next lecture now. <laughs> I thought I thought that you are going to start start the next lecture next lecture with that. That was my idea of asking that question. No, not, that was not, not not a question, but a suggestion. Anyway, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So all right, then shall we uh, call it a day? Yeah. Yeah. So thank maybe, you very much for listening you. to me and paying your kind attention. And thank you. Thank you. For the thank you very much for the because yeah. yeah, it was very clear and um, uh, you initially. To told us that uh, you will uh, ma make us confused, yeah. and that, uh -huh. uh, that uh, <laughs> from the from the second lecture that you will have to unperplex us. But I, I think it was very clear that um, uh, you managed to uh, do do it in a very simple manner, and especially uh, highlight the artifacts, the eye closure, eye opening, and the ECG artifacts, the yeah. telephone chewing artifacts, which were very interesting because we yeah. will be uh, guided by these art artifacts and wrongly diagnosed. And mm. and it was very interesting to listen to you about the abnormal looking normalities in the EEGs because Actually, that's uh, the difference are... between ECG and EEG, you know again and yes. again you know, that's something I learned in the beginning okay oh, this is not going to work because uh, abnormal things are easy to diagnose in the EEG uh, but normal looking you know uh, abnormal looking normality is the problem. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think you made it very simple and very clear to us, and Thank you. you yeah never made us confused i think it was getting more and more clearer to us so from the okay. from the second lecture i think it will be much more clearer and it, uh -huh. if you can uh, <laughs> you know, so if you can highlight me. on the second lecture about some clinical entities like now that uh, the trainee who asked about uh, dementias yeah, yeah. It's a very good and encephalopathy yeah. that kind of uh, if you can concentrate on that it will be really great so uh, we will let you know about the next lecture and the time. And uh, thank you very much for taking your time on a Sunday morning. And no I know problem. that you My have pleasure. hospitals. 
it was uh, very nice of you to have sacrificed your Sunday morning for us. And thank you very much. And we look forward to your next lecture uh, next week. Thanks yeah. a lot Let's see. for taking your time. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye.